Hello everyone. Uh, today I'd like to talk about uh, scientific methods. Um, the question I'd like to ask, is it really true that uh, scientific methods is the only game in town when it comes to modeling natural phenomena? Or perhaps maybe there are alternatives. Maybe some of them are interesting alternatives. Let's see. Now, um, roughly speaking, scientific methods consist of uh, three steps. The first one, you want to select a phenomena, preferably not too complex phenomena, and the one that can be reproducible. Now, the second step is to develop a mathematical model, and for that you would need to use some kind of a mathematical framework or a mathematical theory for that. Um, and the third step would be uh, to, to test the prediction of the model against experiments or observations. Now, uh, the tests are usually, uh, the prediction are usually probabilistic, so of course uh, probability theory plays a crucial uh, role in modeling. Um, but other than that, uh, the, the theory, the approach or method can be considered scientific only if all three of those steps are followed. And if one of them is not followed, then it's perhaps not scientific. So let's take an example. Uh, quantum physics. Now, it had been applied to modeling many phenomena, so that's step one. Um, now, quantum models are built using the mathematical framework or mathematical theory of uh, linear algebra, so that's step two. And um, many of those models were already checked against observation uh, experiments. So that's um, step three. So, so it, it is definitely uh, a scientific uh, theory. It is definitely science. Now, um, but consider something very closely related to quantum mechanics, but not exactly that. Some, sometimes it's referred to as interpretations of quantum mechanics. So let's say uh, the many worlds, the famous many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. Now, is it scientific or not? Well, um, it is not. Now, uh, unfortunately or fortunately, there are no um, theoretical predictions that the theory makes, and so it cannot really be checked against uh, experiments. Now, it may be useful to push the theory further, um, so it may be, uh, but, but it is not science, it's not scientific. Um, so what other options do we have in physics? There are two other frameworks that actually prove to be useful. So one of them is known uh, classical, classical physics or classical mechanics, and that's perhaps uh, the oldest. Um, the other one is statistical uh, mechanics or statistical physics. And those are also legitimate scientific methods, scientific approaches uh, to modeling phenomena. One of them is using calculus and the other one is using probability theory. So, um, and that's about it. So those are the three, the three frameworks that physicists use. Um, and uh, those are the three frameworks that allow us to model different phenomena. Okay, so um, now what else, what else can we say about um, those three frameworks? Well, first of all, none of them is universal. So we cannot say like quantum mechanics can explain all phenomena or classical mechanics can explain all phenomena and the same for statistics. Now, they only have their own um, ranges of validity, right? There may be some overlaps, but nevertheless, these frameworks are not universal. They cannot, any one of them model all phenomena. So in this respect, um, this is not uh, classical quantum or statistical physics is not giving you the framework, providing you with a framework for the so-called uh, theory of everything that will allow you to model everything. Now, um, if such a framework exists, and many believe, for example, string theory uh, is a good candidate for that, then of course that would be great. Uh, however, at the moment, if uh, you look uh, the string theory objectively, you will see that it's actually not a theory of everything, but a theory of nothing. So there is no really new phenomena that it can model, but the work is still in progress. So uh, the whole approach the string theory takes is still still scientific. Uh, meanwhile, the physicists are stuck with those three um, th three theories: quantum, classical, and statistical, um, and and that may be all. However, uh, what what we are discussing here is that there may be a fourth alternative, uh, something that I call the neural physics, 
for the claim that the entire universe is a, is a learning system just like a neural network. Now, if that's the case, the question we can ask, well, can the neural physics can potentially be a theory of, of everything? Can it be a scientific theory of everything to describe everything? Um, now, we are still in the early innings to know for sure, but it is certainly, uh, and, and most of the work right now is not actually in modeling the phenomenon, but an understanding uh, the mathematics, the, the mathematical framework that associated with, uh, with the neural physics. Um, and the main reason for that is because that it contains one very unfamiliar phenomena. Um, and uh, this, this phenomena has to do with the learning dynamics, something we haven't had much experience with. Uh, however, um, what is unique about this neural physics is that potentially it can be um, a, possible to use it to describe phenomena which uh, is not only physical phenomena like quantum mechanics or gravitation, but also biological phenomena um, like biological evolution or the origin of life. So there are uh, already papers written on this uh, issues and I'll discuss them at some point, but not today. Um, now let's try to get back to, to the um, scientific methods and ask um, and look at it from, from a little bit another side, right? Um, so if the universe is a neural network system, uh, can we understand why the scientific methods are useful? So for example, if you have every subsystem in the universe is learning or modeling its own environment, then wouldn't it make sense for every subsystem, subsystem to use some kind of um, scientific methods? Or are there any alternatives to that? So can the subsystem apply some other methods for modeling? Well, the, the answer to this question really depends on the question of the compression. So, for example, if you look at the advanced mathematics, the language of advanced mathematics provides a very, very high level of compression. Um, and it allows us not only model, but also communicates the results of modeling very, very efficiently. Now, in order to achieve such, uh, such a level of compression, uh, the learning system have been uh, trained for a very long time um, and um, it took a long time to get this this level of, of uh, to develop the complex language of advanced mathematics uh, so perhaps not all of the system already have uh, made the transition to learn this language uh, and this high level of, of uh, uh, compression uh, even even our uh, uh, society made this transition to uh, uh, advanced math based transition only very recently um, and it's and the, at the level of humans or individual organisms uh, this is not the transition that that we make um, when we are born but during the lifetime of course once we learn enough mathematics that we can come to a point of understanding more and more mathematics and using uh, knowing how to apply it so we, we can make this phase transition during our lifetime if we choose to, um, but it is not guaranteed. Now, in a uh, second point that um, even if we humans make this phase transition and we get uh, familiar with, as a learning system, get familiar with using the language of advanced mathematics, we still cannot memorize, most of us cannot memorize all of the mathematical results. And so, so ca some kind of external resources uh, must be used for, for storing or processing uh, the relevant information. Um, so th this may be uh, books, computers, uh, notebooks, uh, scientific articles, all those are external resources where we store information um, in a highly compressed manner of what we've learned um, uh, about either mathematics or about the phenomena that we use uh, to model with this advanced mathematics. But then there is this interesting possibility. What if there is some learning system that has access to much larger computational resources, but maybe doesn't have a very uh, high level of compression. Uh, it doesn't use a very high level of uh, compression. Uh, how would it compare with the, with the other system which has access to smaller resources, but nevertheless a high level of compression? So consider an example 
of solving uh, differential equations. And let's say we have a, a, a programmer and a physicist. So a programmer might use uh, numerically, might, might solve this differential equation numerically and use a, a very large computer. And at the same time, a physicist uh, may use analytical methods and so not use very advanced computational resources and solve it just on a piece of uh, paper. So in this example, the, the programmer has access to a much, much larger computational resources, the computer. Uh, however, the, the language that is used for solving problems, the programming language doesn't have as high level of compression as, uh, for example, advanced mathematics that the physicist would use. Um, nevertheless, this method, um, it's kind of a numerical approach, numerical method of solving uh, problems. I still, it's, I still think it's, it's okay and should be considered as a scientific method. So even if not maybe very advanced and uh, highly compressed mathematics is used, it would still be considered um, as, as a scientific modeling, whether it's numerical, numerical modeling or analytic modeling. Now, of course, nothing stops us for, uh, from extrapolating this result to other external resources. So, uh, for example, we may have um, other than computers or pencils and paper. So, for example, um, we individual humans may not have the capacity uh, to perform all of the modelings, phenological modeling of all of the phenomena by ourselves. And so sometimes you would have to rely or in external resources or maybe other scientists who or, or experimentalists or theorists or experimentalists who would do that for you so that you would have to of course first check that those people those resources are, are reliable uh, but once you, it's been checked you can kind of form your own information scientific information bubble um, or maybe it should be called a you know circle of trust people or scientists that you trust and then as long as the scientists within the bubble are in agreement, we, you can you can you kind of believe uh, their results. Now, now this approach is is um, completely non scientific. So you would have to believe somebody else uh, who you think had done uh, the correct modeling, uh, scientific modeling. Um, now, it, it may not be scientific, but pretty much all we can do, right? We we do not have the capacity of performing all of the experiments ourselves, performing all of the modelings ourselves. So we very often uh, have to believe uh, some, some, other, um, some other agents, some of them, say scientists, um, that they know what they are doing, right? Now, in fact, this is the strategy we've been following all our lives, right? So uh, when we're young, we would believe parents, whatever they have to say, we think this is a real, reliable source. Then um, as, as we grow up, maybe we believe teachers when they teach us something. Um, and, and eventually perhaps you form a circle with some professional scientists uh, uh, that, that, that you trust. Now, again, once again, this is not a, a scientific method. It's maybe non-scientific me me method, but nevertheless, this is um, the only thing we can do with one difference from the other approaches I discussed is that we're kind of doing it on the same level, on the level of humans. Um, uh, there are many problems with this approach um, because, or, or because of this bubble, information bubble, even if it's a scientific information bubble that, that is created. Uh, and we shall, shall discuss the problem of those bubbles uh, some other time. But um, b before we go on, uh, let me just mention one uh, other possibility that we haven't looked at yet. Now, what about the hidden space, right? So the neural physics uh, predicts that in addition to the physical space, there, there may be um, a hidden space. And let's say this hidden space has vast, huge computational resources. Uh, maybe we'll call it um, the, the hidden oracle. Um, and then can you use this oracle uh, make use of this oracle. It's external resources to you to make predictions about uh, the universe, to model the universe. Now, it would also be considered as non-scientific and perhaps I'll argue next week that it may be considered as a religious method. But nevertheless, this is uh, something that uh, we can use 
not maybe even not at the level of societies, but at the level of humans ourselves, given that the access to this hidden space exists. And I guess this is a hypothesis that we'll have to check. I mean, um, and um, if it turns out to be true, uh, then we may discuss whether it is beneficial or not beneficial for uh, individual learning system as, as, as they evolve. So this is something we'll discuss next time uh, about the hidden stance, but that's all I had uh, for today. So um, thanks for listening and I'll, I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.